Since my birthday is in the middle of Spooktober, I thought that this year I'd celebrate the occasion by making this video looking at Easter eggs and fun facts in Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted. We'll start our journey off right with the opening sequence. Of course, this and the rest of the game was made to be experienced in virtual reality, but since I don't own an actual VR headset, the majority of the footage was recorded in flat mode, which doesn't require VR. That said, this gentle introduction to the Freddy Fazbear virtual experience includes the first available glitchy tape, which we will collect but talk about much later on. Also, <laughs> I should note that there is a digital user agreement of very questionable legality because if you wait long enough, it'll accept itself automatically, assuming that your lack of response was acceptance. Well then. That done, we come upon the main hub, situated in this super not spooky digital pizzeria. There's a button to swap over to the prize corner and another inside of a pail of candy to jump into the Curse of Dreadbear DLC, assuming you have that, but most importantly is the minigame selection monitor. With each minigame section, we can see a friendly little animatronic bear on screen in various outfits and situations. His name is Helpy, and there is actually a small chance that randomly upon reloading into the hub, he'll be resting off to the side of the monitor, pointing towards the large switch. If you don't know, that switch turns on the black lights, which is used to access hard mode, but much like the tapes, we'll talk about that later. The first playable section is pulled straight from FNAF 1, brought into the third dimension. Like, literally, because fun fact if you don't know, the original few games were all mostly composed of flat images wrapped around the player to simulate 3D. That said, this version maintains all of the same mechanics from the first, doors that you can spend power to keep closed, a CCTV system composed of cameras with the resolution of a Game Boy Color, you know, th the classics. Also, fun fact, in flat mode, it's literally impossible to touch the button on the phone so Mr. Phone Guy cannot be muted. Also, if you're curious, you can still boop Freddy's nose on the poster for a nice honk if you are so inclined. On night two, Foxy of course joins the fun, and in this game, there is an exclusive feature to accommodate the player's movability. Basically, if you move outside the office or pop your head out using the available prompt in flat mode, Foxy will come sprinting down the hall to jump scare you. At first I thought this was an unavoidable death, but if you're careful, you can anger the pirate, pop back in, and close the door. This drains your power like normal, but otherwise keeps you safe. A normal person would then continue to play normally, but you could also just sort of keep taunting him until your luck runs out. FNAF 2's escapades are much like its original. It has a different shape, but the same spooky hallway, vents, and music box that we all know and tolerate. The boopable Freddy Nose is also in place, as is a rare chance to have Endo 02 spawn in upon reloading the game. In the original, he could be seen via the camera, but in this one, he'll just stand awkwardly in front of the player's desk for the whole night. The Fazbear virtual experience also includes the home of Springtrap, aka FNAF 3, out of contractual obligation, no doubt, because in my opinion, this this game, this game mode, it just sucks. But hey, at least there is a nice little chance for a nice little coffee machine animatronic to spawn at the end of the desk. Most first saw Adventure Coffee as an odd inclusion to FNAF World, but it was actually the protagonist of one of Scott Cawthon's previous games, The Desolate Hope. It can also randomly appear back behind the counter of the prize corner, though I wasn't able to get that on camera myself. Speaking of the prize corner, it's worth pointing out that after successfully completing any of the minigames, you'll be rewarded with some kind of collectible. There's plushies, action figures, food, that sort of thing. You can eat the food for a nice snack, or any of the action figures, which results in a short coughing fit. If you consume three action figures in a row, you straight up die, which is probably one of the more realistic things in this game. It's a good lesson, even for the animatronics. Don't eat things that aren't food. Back to stuff in the minigames, the next section is called the Dark Rooms, which starts with the Plush Trap and Nightmare Balloon Boy segments from FNAF 4. While playing a spooky version of Red Light Green Light, there is a chance that a Minarina can spawn in nearby. Much like the other random appearances shown thus far, it doesn't do anything, but hey, it's there. Also, the Dark Rooms is home to an original minigame, made specifically for this game. Don't get me wrong, the plush babies aren't any spookier than the other animatronics, it's just that their minigame sucks really hard. 
There's too many spawns. It takes forever for them to go away. And even with the recharging of the flashlight, it has like the battery life of an old Wiimote. Zero to 10, do not recommend. Anyways, moving on. Parts and services is all about some good old repairing. Good job. Fun fact. During Chica's repair, you can feed her a piece of pizza by tossing it into her open maw. It's unsettling and required for one of the game's fast coins. Another fun fact is that if you subscribe right now, you're 25% less likely to get jump scared and 95% more likely to get notified when my videos go live. Also, it's worth appreciating that the final action needed to close up Freddy's chest cavity after his nice repair face. is booping his nose. There you go, the honking finally makes sense. Now, in vent repair, you have to go through a series of tasks while either Mangle or Ennard keeps watch from nearby. Some could call Mangle's management style overbearing, but I think he really just wants to see you do a good job. While you're working on the vent, if you steal a quick glance downwards, each session has a chance that Endo 2 will be hanging out right below the grate that you're standing on. Hey, what's up? The final stretch of non-DLC minigames are Night Terrors, which are mostly based on FNAF 4. During the Circus Baby one, where you try to avoid getting spooked by the big and small babies, there will be yet another random chance that upon loading in, Biddy Bab will just be hanging out. Yet another baby. That said, while we're not totally done with base game stuff, let's pop over to the Curse of Dreadbear DLC, which was released for Halloween of 2019 that I'm finally talking about. So its menu area has its own little details, all of which are neat yet pointless. For example, there's a random chance that rather than getting a green sky, upon loading in you'll see maybe a red sky, or even an orange sky. Ooh, neat. Also, looking back into the left, you might spot Foxy's pirate ship out on the lake. If you hang around, it might stick around for just as long, or maybe get pulled down by the Kraken, or get pulled down by the Kraken as soon as you swap the blacklight. I really don't know the actual parameters here, but hey, that's something. Also, I should point out that if you stare at the lake for a minute after loading in, there's a chance, just a small chance, I, I tried for 10 minutes, finally got it, that Dreadbear will actually show up out of the lake, walking right past you. Well, look at him, he's just, walking. Very slowly. Nice. Now the first of the three sections for the DLC is called Afraid of the Dark, which has three very different minigames. The Plushkin patch is yet another abomination filled with plush babies, while the Pirate Ride and Corn Maze are both Foxy-centric fun. In Pirate Ride, you have a bouncy ball gun used to shoot at glowing targets throughout the ride. Your first go of it makes it seem like an easy and safe time, as there is little danger. As long as you score at least 1000 points, you won't get jump scared. With higher point totals, you'll unlock secret pathways, which can be chosen by bonking a metal helpy cut out at certain points. That's important because it'll take multiple attempts to unlock all the areas, which at minimum requires 8100 points. That said, here's a quick overview of what a full ride looks like with all these side areas because they are pretty neat. From the start, bonking the helpy behind Foxy lets us head into a short side area which has this spooky corner where we must hit every red button before Jacko Chica gets us. That done, the ride goes into the underwater area which is usually at the end of a standard run. This helpy allows us to double back via a sort of kitchen area after that. It's a little jaunt through a storage area to find ourselves back at the very start of the normal route. Two sets later, at the Kraken Ride, another helpy lets us turn towards a hallway reminiscent of FNAF 1. This includes three sets of doors on either side, which will open up and have targets, a button to close the door, and perhaps a spooky animatronic. Take too long to hit the door buttons, and you die. After the doors, the ride turns through a room which has an odd glitched clown poster to the left and we start to head towards the underwater section again. However, if you have him unlocked, bunking this helpy will make it so that after merging through the Kraken portal, you'll actually be in what looks like the ride's basement. Amongst the various spooky pipes are a bunch of valuable targets. We fade to black after reaching the section with vents, and then we have this spot where we must repeatedly hit the red buttons on either side to delay the two spooky animatronics from reaching us. This isn't too hard, but in flat mode, since you're static and you can't move around, I literally couldn't hit the right side buttons at all after a certain point. Still, with that I was able to escape with my life, and we found ourselves at the end. Look at that! I'm now an admiral! Excellent. That done, uh, since we'll touch on the Corn Maze minigame shortly, let's jump forward into Spooky Mansion. I 
have nothing to add here. These games just exist. They're not offensively bad or all that fun. As far as I know, they don't really hold any secrets, so uh, here, have a participation award for existing. Good job. Lastly, the Danger Keep Out minigames are a more difficult take on the FNAF 1 formula. The doors cannot be closed, and instead you have flimsy boards, which can only withstand a few hits from the halloween -y animatronics. The power is tied directly to your light, which takes the form of powerful bursts, which make the baddies temporarily back off. I'm not a huge fan of this one, but I think it does the job of being spooky and tense. Much like the base game's version, sticking your head out through the boards results in a fiery foxy jump scare. This is impossible in flat mode, but with my janky VR setup, I realize that it also works with the right hallway. Also, on the third night, if you pick up the phone when it's not ringing and the red light is off, things get weird. then. Back in the DLC's main hub, there's a couple more little easter eggs. If you press the button on the side of the monitor, which is seen easier with the black light on, when you turn around you'll find that the truck's headlights have turned purple. Ooh, spooky. If you stare at this for like 5 to 10 seconds and then look past the monitor, out into the distance, in prior versions, this resulted in a massive dread bear posed above the distant house. Now, you get this. See? It's, it's right there, right? Right there, on screen. Yeah, like, a half mile away is an animatronic dancing on a hill. Quick aside, like I mentioned before, I don't have an actual VR headset, so I used a program called V-Ridge that lets my phone act as the headset for my computer. This isn't a sponsorship thing, I just wanted to mention how I made it happen. Built into V-Ridge's options is a free roam movement system, which is how I was able to get up close and personal with our mysterious dancer. Also, while the... Emulated hand controls are awful, at least with the minimal testing and setup I did. The free movement let me rush through the hallway minigame. I did this so I could easily reach the victory scene, which takes place in a barn. At random, the posters to the left, right, and behind you will change. <laughs> so I spent about a half hour straight of speed cheating my way to victory just so that I can finally get what I wanted. Three clown posters. Since I didn't want to lose this opportunity, I very carefully delivered a dart into each poster to activate the easter egg. It's me. Ooh, a cryptic message. Purple lighting. Those purple headlights. It must all mean something. Probably. Who knows. Anyways, we're finally going to talk about those glitchy purple tapes that I glossed over earlier, which means we're going to talk about spoilers, because uh, I'm going to show and discuss all the endings, even for the DLC. Okay? Okay? Okay, so the tape shown in the opening sequence is one of 16 spread throughout the game. These can be listened to in the tape room, which can be unlocked by hitting the glowy tape recorder with an object on the shelf in the prize corner. I won't cover every tape location, but to give you an idea of what they look like, there's two in the prize corner, one inside the counter, and another in the gumball machine, one sitting on the desk in FNAF 1, another is in the trash can when repairing Chica, that sort of thing. To sum things up and grossly oversimplify things, each tape has a voice log recorded by Tape Girl. She was part of a development team that was working on this game, Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience, and among other things, she explains how that during bug testing she came across this mysterious anomalous character. And it turns out that by creating these tapes and then hiding them in the game's code, she allowed the anomaly, which has been dubbed Glitch Trap, to attach itself to the logs, which means that Getting all the tapes is required to kill Glitchrap, but that also means it makes it more whole along the way. Throughout your playthrough, depending on how many tapes you've collected, you might spot a translucent Glitchrap close by, just out of view. So, yeah, that's sort of the idea behind the tapes. Now, the endings. The bad ending involves unlocking the final minigame, Night Terror's Pizza Party. This maze contains three of the tapes and ends with the player backstage. Glitch Trap beckons you forward, and if you go, you'll find yourself holding a microphone on stage, meaning that you've pretty much been stuffed into a Freddy Fazbear suit by the big bad. Oops. That said, completing the Pizza Party minigame rewards the player with the gallery. 
a subroom in the hub which holds the last tape that you can collect. Tape 16 tells you how to destroy Glitch Trap. You want to let it begin to merge with you, play the music, and flip the switch on the monitor. If you fail to follow Tape Girl's instructions, you'll find yourself on stage once more, this time as, I think, Spring Bonnie? So you died. That's, that's what's most important. If you follow the instructions properly, this causes the screen to fade out and back into a mysterious metal door. The lock slides open, Glitch Trap tries to be all spooky, and uh, yeah, that's it. Vague, mysterious, weird, classic FNAF. What's easily overlooked here is the DLC's ending, which involves Foxy's corn maze that I passed over earlier. There are four gates and four keys. Normally, you'd want to collect one key and escape out the color-coded gate, but for this we need all four keys. This initially seemed very difficult, but Foxy's AI here is very easily tricked by simply baiting him into charging and then hiding back in a cutout. When you do this, he disappears and spawns somewhere else nearby. With this and this very handy map made by Reddit user Pay2C username, I got all four keys which spawned a fifth glitch key somewhere else in the maze. After collecting that key, it's back to the center because now we can climb down into the cellar. In here, we find a white rabbit mask, which, once worn, ends the minigame and takes us back to the DLC's title screen. Now, heading to the prize corner reveals that same rabbit mask resting against the TV. If you wear the mask and grab the glitch trap plush, or just hold it nearby, you'll hear a voice presumably talking to glitch trap, or whatever purpley, mysterious entity he represents. Yes, I hear you. I know. No. There's no miscommunication. I understand. Yes, I have it. I made it myself. I think you would like it. No, no one suspects anything. Don't worry. I'll be ready, and I won't let you down. It will be fun. From what I understand, that voice belongs to a character known as the Reluctant Follower, which was named Vanny thanks to a cryptic post on Scott Coughlin's website. At this point, I should also note that upon beating the base game, you can now find a basket of exotic butters on the price corner. Carefully removing the butter from the basket, you'll find a clickable red button which turns on the TV in the upper left of the prize corner. In previous patches, this showed vague hints as to what was coming basically upcoming patches. In the most recent one, it shows an odd angle of the pizza party backstage area. Heading back there, off to the right is an open door with snow blowing in. Once through that door, we find a snowy area, with a coming soon billboard from Fazbear Entertainment. Off the distance is a large building under construction. While it was slowly teased throughout 2020, it was eventually officially announced that the next game, FNAF Security Breach, will be launching alongside the PS5 later this year. It seems that it'll take place inside of a mall, which is no doubt that building that was under construction, and will most likely feature Vanny as the main antagonist. So yeah, that more or less covers everything in FNAF Help Wanted that I wanted to discuss, so let's end things here. Thank you for watching, thanks to my channel members for their support, with a spookily big thanks to Chrissy Huntress, Pseudonymous, Germanger, and Achilles Rhodes for being superfans. Now, according to the sunk cost fallacy, if you watched this far, you might as well subscribe and maybe even leave a like, comment, and uh, maybe watch some of my other stuff. That's it for this one, I'll see you in the next video.